Well, good evening to you guys once again. I am somewhere north of Coral Pink Sand Dunes State Park. In fact, this whole dune system in front of me is a continuation of Coral Pink Sand Dunes, and it's going to be the topic of this video. But before I actually get onto the dunes, I want to talk about this thing right here in front of me. All these plants that look like grass are actually uh, a relative of grass called rushes. Which remember the family Juncaceae, and particularly Regina's Juncus. And they are typically indicators of wetland habitat, which is a bit odd because it doesn't seem like much of wetland most likely. But in a sense, it kind of is. You see, what happens with these dunes often is that water can percolate all the way through to the bottom until it hits some sort of surface that it can't, which actually then starts flowing downhill until it um, reaches the end of a dune and emerges, leaving a sort of habit like this, or habitat like this, a bit of an odd wetland that seems quite out of place. But that's most likely what's happening right here. But regardless, let's go see what we have at the top of this hill of sand. This is not too easy to rock up, but it'll be well worth it. There we are. Incredible. Now, dunes as an ecosystem are pretty interesting because they are a very tough environment for many organisms to survive in, especially plants. So the ones you find growing here have a lot of special adaptations to survive the incredibly harsh conditions. Dunes are very exposed because not a lot of plants can grow here and not a lot of plants can grow here because of how exposed it is. It's a bit of a circular reasoning, but it's just kind of how it is. And the thing about dunes is that they are constantly being rearranged by the wind with sand being blown from one place to another burying or exposing different locations and plants really don't like that. I mean plants are extremely vulnerable in a lot of ways because they can't really choose where they grow and they certainly can't change where they grow so they need the conditions they're living in to be somewhat stable and dunes directly attack this stability that plants need. So a lot of normal plants if they grow here will find their roots exposed or find themselves buried and you just can't deal with it very well. So to survive here plants need some special adaptations uh, one of the most important ones is the ability to propagate through the roots and stems at different, in various different ways. You see, when plants get buried here, the ones that are well adapted to survive will send the roots outward through the sand, which helps stabilize the new sediment around them. And also they can then produce shoots up through the sand, which again, further helps stabilize and also catch further sand sort of continue the cycle so they can grow upwards and outwards through the sand, which is, of course, extremely important and allows them to always be above the level of the sand. This is actually a pretty important for the dunes themselves too because when plants do this, they help to stabilize the dunes and make it a better habitat for some other organisms to survive on. And you can sort of see this going on right in front of us here. I don't entirely sure what species of grass this is. I think it's sand dropsy, which is a sporobolus something or other. Um, I did talk about Sporobolus virginicus in Hawaii. This is a member of the same genus, though this one's only really found, well, I don't know, different places than that one is. But regardless, you can see very clearly here how over the years it has grown outwards and away from the center pile of sand. Um, but naturally, as the wind blows sand over the blades of this grass, they will get stuck on it and fall to the ground, which allows it to pile up. And this is no problem for this grass species because it will just grow right through it. And as it does this, or at least over the weeks, months, and years, it grows outward by sending shoots up from the roots that it sends outward. Along with some interesting formation of sort of, it's almost like a fairy ring, except with grass, that we find developed here. Very fascinating stuff, and it's a good example of how these plants can survive. This one's a lot younger, of course. That one's a little more contiguous. And there's a few other species here that we can find that um, do this, they have a sort of growth habitat. Growth habit, I mean, whatever. Another interesting dune plant we can find here is Iriogonum alatum, which is growing right in front of me. It's also known as the winged buckwheat. It doesn't just only grow on dunes. I've seen it grow in very sandy soil all throughout the region. But again, the soil has to be sandy and it really, really likes this nice deep sand on the dunes because it doesn't have much competition to deal with. You can see here, it's a pretty tall for a buckwheat. It's actually, this one, if I sand it up straight, would be 
about seven and a half foot, which is, I think probably, that might make it the tallest buckwheat species, or species of Eriogonum. And um, I don't, I think it's an annual, not annual, it's definitely a perennial plant, but I believe it grows, it includes a flower stalk every single year. Very nice. Plants we got. We do have sagebrush, of course, in this habitat. Though I don't know how well they can survive this. It looks like, from the looks of it here, it might be propagating through the sand. But I, I don't know for the fact that that's a habit that the sagebrush tends to engage in. So guys, let's move on. Down the hill. See here where the sand is less deep and probably a lot more stable than at the top of the dune there. We have a forest of pinyon juniper. With a lot of the same, you know, the usual suspects we can find on the dunes, which is the uh, Scabrifia scabra. But also a lot more other stable plants, like the sagebrush seems to be doing a lot better as well. Now as I head back onto the dunes out of that sort of sagebrush forest habitat here, we can see we're getting more of the dune plants again. I can talk about one of my favorite ones you can find here, which is this member of the sunflower family. This is Scabrifia scabra, also known as the Badlands mule's ear. I can't say for sure if it lives in Badlands, but I definitely know for a fact it loves the sand dunes. And in fact, I don't think I've seen it growing anywhere aside from the sand dunes. And it should be very clear here that it's got some adaptations that help it survive, or at least one, which is the fact that it can grow and propagate through its roots, which allows it to survive being buried quite well now, this genus Scabrifia might sound a lot like another one I've talked about in a few other videos, which is Waifia. And if you notice that, you are definitely onto something because for a while, these two genera were thought to be one. In fact, there was only Waifia. But a genetic testing has shown that Waifia is not a truly monophyletic genus. It is actually uh, paraphyletic and need to be broken up. And this species, formerly a Waifia scabra, was just changed to Scabrifia scabra. Uh, not exactly the most clever way to change a species or a genus name that only has one species in it, but you know, I'll take it, I guess. And um, yeah, it's, as like I said, it's a monotypic genus. It's the only member of it. And it can be found in a fair amount of places in the West, like certainly much further north, like up into Montana and further south into Arizona. Although to be fair, I am pretty close to Arizona right now. I mean, look at that. Look how much there is right there. They just love the sand dunes. See a lot of the dead Eriogonum alatum stems right here from previous years. That's sort of a feature of the, it's almost like a yucca stem, but that's one of the features of them is that they are very persistent and will survive for many years after the plant has died, or at least how the stem has died. What plants we got? Not sure what that is, but it looks really nice. And down we go. Now, continuing along further here, we reach yet another interesting aspect of the dune ecosystem, which is to say the inner dune swales. Now, dune systems, of course, have troughs and crests, if you think about them as sort of waves. And swales are sort of a type of trough, one where the water level or water table is quite high and close to the surface, which can lead to a lot of wetland plants being present. Right here it's mostly just some more rush species and some other flowering plants. But regardless, it's very similar to the thing I showed you at the beginning. And the mechanisms that create these are quite similar because water not necessarily flowing downhill to here, but flowing through the sand to the level of the water table will eventually reach a relatively low point like this where plants can get their roots that, wet and can take advantage of the abundant moisture which in the desert is quite rare so this is a very special place. It is of course a wetland although it may not look like your typical wetland and although you won't find any ducks waiting here of course you will find a lot of other animals and a lot of animals do depend on these mostly insects but also grazers to an extent. I mean insects are the only ones that can actually get drinkable water from here in large enough quantities, but that vegetation will be very critical for a lot of animals. This can also be uh, cooler microsites, which is always very much appreciated when 
it regularly gets to over 100 degrees here. So yeah, and another interesting thing, or just more, not interesting, it's a fact is that you almost always find subtle differences in these swales, and if you encounter more, it'll be very clear what I'm talking about. They'll never all exactly the same. So let's carry on. Oh, we got another interesting one here. Um, I believe this is Iriogonum inflatum. This is one that uh, Crime Pays But He Doesn't has talked quite a lot about in his earlier videos. Uh, it's a very interesting looking plant, of course, because it's got a very odd shape. And if you were to squeeze it, the stem here, you'll see that it's hollow. Oops, didn't mean to make, to crush it a little bit, but regardless, that'll be fine. Regardless, um, it's another species of Iriogonum or buckwheat, and when it's actually fairly common in deserts, not just on sand dunes, but really in a lot of places, and fairly widespread throughout the West. Though there are a few species that have adapted to inflate themselves like this. Basically, it's a way to get taller, get above other plants, and photosynthesize without having to spend as much energy. That's sort of the purpose of the whole inflated stem. And it's a pretty good adaptation. Of course, not every low point in the dune system is going to be a wetland swale. As you should hopefully see right here, it's just a, sort of a bottom of sand dune. And most of the vegetation is roughly the same as that which you'd find on the crest of the dunes, except, strangely enough, a little bit more sparse. See, the thing is, it's just not um, close enough to the water table, the soil surface right here to support wetland plants. And really there's a lot of things that can cause these variations in how wet the bottom of, or a sort of dune trough is, such as undulations in the actual bedrock beneath the sand dunes, because sometimes you might be higher up than one trough, yet there'll be a wetland there because the rocks underneath are quite close to the surface. Once again, creating a high water table in the region, very locally, of course. I might as well talk about now. Another plant we can see here, of course, very commonly, this is Erica marionaziosa. Very, very common plant all throughout the Colorado Plateau and other parts of the West. But one that does seem to like the sand dunes a lot and the sandy soils a lot. But it doesn't mean it needs them. It will thrive on a lot of different soils, but it definitely comes into a light of its own right here in terms of how abundant it is. Remember the sunflower family, as a lot of the plants out here are. Here, I'll elaborate a little bit more for you guys. You're wondering why it's bad for a plant to be partly buried in sand. I mean, being totally buried should be pretty obvious why that's bad. But being partly buried is not great either because plants are usually not adapted to have uh, soil around the stem. And one of the worst things that can happen from this is that water will be held close to the stem and this can lead to rot. See, most plants aren't really able to handle that very well. Hmm, it's an interesting sign. Yeah, I really hope this doesn't, this area doesn't get opened up to OHVs. I really, in fact, the whole place should just be closed down. I mean, they already have coral pink sand dunes to ride to their heart's content. I think every single square inch of sand dunes needs to be obliterated by ATVs. But regardless of my opinions on land management, there's a nice Scabrifia scabra flower for you. Very clear, you can see how it's a member of the sunflower family and how the flower looks a bit like that of the um, sort of Yafia, or at least Yafia amplexicalis, the only one I've showed you so far. Um, but yeah, not quite the same, I don't feel like. Now look at this here. I found another dune wetland right here. See, there's a bunch of rushes again. There's already sedges. No, we're definitely rushes. I wish I knew what species they were, but I really can't be confident. They're a very difficult genus to uh, key out. But we also have the Salix exigua, or sandbar willow, or coyote willow. A very common species of willow around here, actually the most common you'll find in the desert. And for some reason, some seeds just got here and they're fr absolutely thriving. Well, I mean, they can be a lot taller, but still, they're doing very well here. This is clearly a good place for water retention in the soil, even though it looks fairly dry right now. I should mention at this point that it's been raining f fairly frequently these last few days here. And that might have some effect on the vegetation, but it won't just make these willows pop up overnight, of course. Or the rushes, even. Fascinating. See if you may find any interesting wildflowers there. Now we're probably going to find anything, but regardless, 
few at least one example of how these sort of swales or at least dune wetlands in general can be very unique and different from each other. Look, look at that grove. It's probably not more than a thousand square feet or for you metrically inclined 100 square meters in area. Well, I'm also happy to see this here, but I found my first definite invasive plant, which is Verbascum thapsis or uh, Willy Mullian. A lot of people really like this plant, even though it's terrible and totally invasive outside of its native range. And we got another one right there. Not to mention a bunch of babies. My feet. Don't worry, I'll take care of them. There may have been a few other invasive species, like some invasive grass, but I just I can't say for sure that they were invasive. Um, speaking of grass, you got some nice Areacoma hymenoides. Of course, the Indian rice grass. Because I think I've opened up their sort of... Uh, uh, whatever it does to hold the seeds in place and let them loose. So, no we're making any Indian rice out of that for the season. Let's see what's up that way. Well guys, we have yet another swale right here. This one really pushing the boundary of where wetland plants can grow. I mean, most of what you see here is definitely not a wetland plant, but there is just a few rushes growing right up from the soil. See the nice little rust seeds or fruits, or whatever you want to call them. You know, a lot of what we call seeds colloquially are actually fruits, especially on grasses and rushes and sedges and other things that we, we think produce seeds, but they're actually fruits with seeds inside of them. I'm sure a lot of you guys knew that. Regardless, though, I think what may have happened here is that the maybe the sand was lower at one point, and that's when wetland plants got established, and then the sand just kept getting piled on and the plants just grew through the sand with the roots still at the water table, allowing this extremely sparse, I mean, I, you can't really call it a wetland at this point, but it does have some wetland plants that are clearly benefiting from the low point here, growing. I don't know, you can call it a wetland if you want, it doesn't really matter. But nevertheless, onward to the dunes. The sun hasn't set yet. Okay, well, that was washed out. If it wasn't washed out, you'd see some crepuscular rays though. So anyways, on board, let's see if we can make it. I'll try to ignore the mullion in the wetland there. It's a much nicer swale, actually. Okay, really quick. This is actually a really nice example of the swale I was talking about again. This one really does seem very wetlandy, actually. Like, it'd be hard not to argue that it's a wetland. Look down right here. Some other signs of wetland stuff. Some cracked soil and the like. Put step in some cow poop. This field was full of cows yesterday, I should say. I, I did, this is not my first time being here and walking here. Ah, oh, damn it, it didn't pull out the root. Um, I was here yesterday doing a little bit of exploration, dropped my camera, and I think I walked through here, but uh, there were definitely some cows enjoying the uh, meadow, but there's not, they're not here anymore. Shoot. How bad do we want to see this stuff? Well, I can crawl underneath there, I guess. All right, let's roll. Man, I don't know what I'm doing here. I think you guys are gonna watch this video. I don't care. I'm just having so much fun. Definitely, when I'm actually good at making videos and have a bigger audience, I'll return to here and remake this video and it'll be much better, much more eloquent. Not much more of those rushes I was talking about. And just, it'll just be a better video. Now, this is what I call dunes. I think it'd be way taller if I was just a little bit further south. A coral pink. See this grass around? I don't know what it is. I think it's native. It grows pretty damn tall, like up to five or six feet. I'm yeah, pretty tall for a grass out here, especially if there's hungry cows about. Let's get up that one hill. You guys are wondering, I'm not on private land, but oh my gosh, is that what I think it is? Oh man, this is so worth it. Oh 
my god, I think it is. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is actually an extremely rare plant. What you're witnessing right now is one of my few <laughs> genuine reactions on this channel. I'm not expecting to see these here. This is Asclepius welshii. A species of milkweed is actually completely endemic to the coral pink sand dunes. We have some just growing right here. I don't know what makes them endemic to here. I'm not sure if they need this habitat to thrive. And Crime Pays by and didn't made a video about these guys. And of course it had to be right here because you will not find them anywhere else in the world. Dang, there's a few of them growing up here. A part of what tells them apart from other species of milkweed is the way their leaves are hairy. I mean, there are some with hairy leaves, but something's different about them here, and I don't want to hurt invasive endangered species. See the milky sap. Um, as penance for harming this uh, milkweed, guys, I will promise to rip out that entire field of mullein, that wetland. I might really regret that promise right now because that's a lot of mullein, but I will have to pay penance for it somehow. Okay, now we really want to go to the top. Oh, that one looks like some fruit. <laughs> no, it's flowering. Oh, right, right on. There you go. You can see it's very typical um, milkweed flowers right here. The stigmatics and all that stuff that I'm sure Joey Santor explained way better than me. Okay, I'll stop making references to his channel. Regardless, really awesome to see this plant here. I was not expecting to see that. Man, okay, this has made my day. Totally worth it to come out here. But we still gotta get to the top. Wow. Incredible. What an amazing country we have. An amazing Colorado Plateau. I think part of the reason why there's not a lot of stuff growing here, when you get like sort of blowouts right on the dune system, which I, I should have talked about, but again, I'll make a better video someday. Um, regardless, um, I think part of it's because there's a lot of off-road traffic over. There's no tire tracks right here at the moment. Hmm. Oh, the sun's coming down. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. It's probably a really way too long video, but uh, appreciate it anyways. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Well, that's 70 stocks, including this one that's gone to sea, which I'll have to take care of somewhere else. You know, it took longer than I would hope at this time of day, but not too long in total, actually. Only about 15 minutes. But I got stung by a bee that was clinging to one of the uh, stalks of mullion. Ow. It really hurts. Does my hand look red? Okay, my hand doesn't look that red on camera, I promise. Oh, yeah, you can't see it. Whatever. Definitely not worth a bunch of... Just show you one milkweed. See ya.